This is the nose of a Rafale. This is the nose of the Eurofighter Typhoon. This is the Gripen E. This is the Sukhoi 30 MKI. And this is the MiG-35. Did you notice anything? I am sure that many among you have recognized the globes on the nose of the planes in the intro. They are infrared search and track sensors. The Erst is a type of sensor that uses the temperature of the target to generate a track for the pilot in a way similar to what a radar does. The Americans, after having snapped it for a few decades, are coming back to it. The F-35 has one and the F-18 and the F-15 have been given infrared search and track pods. The fact that these sensors are becoming increasingly integrated in the air combat tactics is only one of the reasons why stealth planes do exist. Now, if you are thinking that stealth is about radars, you are right. But today, we are going to talk about infrared stealth. Infrared is the electromagnetic radiation emitted by an object in, well, normal condition. The hotter the object, the more radiation it emits. It is more useful for detection than visible light because having a longer wavelength, it can penetrate clouds and fog better. Also, at night, when light is absent, bodies still emit infrared radiation. The radar looks for reflected energy from the target, but the Infrared search and track uses the infrared radiation to create images and extract information from them to create a track on the pilot's HUD or on a presentation screen. Obviously, there are other devices that make use of infrared radiation and probably the most common use is for infrared homing. We have already covered in the past how the Erst and the forward-looking infrared and infrared homing do actually work. And I suggest to view those videos to better understand them. In fact, in this video, we are discussing how to make life difficult for all those devices. Infrared radiation for practical purposes is usually divided in three bands. The near-infrared has a wavelength between 0.7 and 1.5 micrometer. It is emitted by the sun and it is reflected from the aircraft's external surfaces. The medium-infrared lays between 1.5 and 6 micrometers. At short wavelength, the aircraft reflects the sun radiation, but at longer wavelengths above roughly 3 micrometers, the thermal signature of the hot parts and the exhaust plume become prevalent. All air-to-air -air missiles have sensors particularly sensitive in the higher part of the medium infrared. The far or long infrared refers to wavelengths between 7 and 14 micrometers. At these frequencies, the main source of radiation is the Earth, and the aircraft either directly emits the radiation or reflects the Earth illumination. Earths tend to use these frequencies because they are the most effective in penetrating fog and dust. The infrared signature of a plane is the combination of all the emissions and reflection in all these bands. The signature is always present and since the sources are the sun, the earth or the plane itself, all infrared sensors can identify a target remaining totally passive. Radars emit energy and this energy can, in principle, be detected by the target, but infrared sensors just receive energy from the target, so there is no way for the target itself to understand if it has been spotted. The infrared signature of an aircraft depends heavily from the aspect, since the main emitters of infrared radiation are the engines and the exhaust plume, it is easier to detect a plane from the rear. Modern Ersts have ranges comparable to radars if the target is showing the tail, but they are drastically reduced if the target is closing toward the sensor, showing just the frontal surfaces. However, frontal surfaces are subject to aerodynamic heating. A plane traveling around Mach 1.5 has temperatures on the nose and the wing leading edges around 100 degrees Celsius. These hot parts are hot enough to be used for detection. All the modern infrared homing missiles can lock on 
these hot areas. Okay, I believe it is clear enough that a plane in flight is quite a good source of infrared radiation. Now the problem is, how do we hide it? Let's start from the aerodynamic heating, the easy one. One solution is use the fuel as a heat sink to cool the surface down. It is actually also useful to cool the electronics and in particular the jammers that can become very hot. This is an effective solution for the wing leading edge, but it may become unpractical for other hot surfaces, like the air intake cowlings or the radum, which is usually the hottest point. The F-35 uses this approach on the wing and the vertical empennages. Actually, the air scoop on the top right of the fuselage provides fresh air to the fuel air heat exchanger to keep the fuel cool. Um, and to be fair, the F-35 has a particular and innovative system to manage the thermal loads, uh, but this is a story for another time. However, it might be fun to know that on the earlier F-35 variants, there was the necessity to open the weapon bays every now and then to refresh the inside. I think it has been fixed by now. Another solution is to use infrared suppressive skin coating. These are materials that have a very low emissivity. At the same temperature, they emit less radiation than, for example, uh, aluminium or the normal aeronautic paints. Unconfirmed news say that the F-22 and the F-45 coating can reduce the infrared emission in the far infrared of about 50%. And these coatings are also reported to change the spectral composition of the emitted infrared. They emit more energy at those wavelengths where the atmosphere absorbs the radiation the most. In fact, the atmosphere is not uniformly transparent to infrared, like it is in the visible light, more or less. There are some ranges of wavelengths that are absorbed by water or CO2. If the infrared is emitted in those windows, it is yeah, quickly absorbed by the atmosphere, it just goes away. A major source of infrared emissions are those parts of the fuselage that are heated by the engines. The heating is usually a serious problem not only for the emitted infrared, but also for the structural stress created by the high temperature. In fact, the rear of the fuselage where the engines are located is the area where the heat-resistant materials like titanium are used more often. To reduce the infrared signature, the only solution is to cool these parts too. Modern jets usually drain some air from the low-pressure stage of the compressors to inject it around the hottest part of the engine, uh, more to cope with the structural heating than the stealth, to be honest. The F-35, which was designed for stealth but also has a very hot engine, well, it has two large underwing scoops to refresh the area around the engine. Gone are the days when the temperature inside a jet fighter flying at high altitude went 20 or 30 degrees below zero. Now engines and electronics create the opposite problem and the inside of a fighter needs to be cooled down. Chuck Higger in his autobiography tells how he was able to store a fur coat as a present for his wife in a small closet on a P-80 and how the coat arrived undamaged despite the freezing temperatures. The hottest part of the whole plane is the nozzle, and you may imagine it is the part that is very difficult to cool. The F-35 is basically unique in its attempt, blowing the cold air that has previously flowed inside the plane to cool the engine all around the nozzle. There is a small gap between the fuselage panels and the nozzle, and it is where the air is blown from. Around the F-22 nozzles there are some small gaps visible, but it I was unable, honestly, to confirm if a similar system is installed on the plane. From the rear aspect also, the inner parts of the engine are visible through the nozzle and they are by far the strongest infrared emitter. Since reducing the temperature in the turbine will severely limit the engine performance, a way to reduce the infrared signature is using a cooled blocker. The blocker is a plate inserted in the central part of the exhausted covers part of the turbine. If the plate is cooled, uh, the infrared signature of the turbine is reduced. 
the F-22 and the F-35 both seem to have one. The exhaust plume is a powerful infrared emitter. It is a large feature filled with hot gas that stands out against the sky or the ground colder by ground. And even more so when the afterburner is in use since both temperature and size increase. Actually, one of the reasons why the supercruise is so important among the others is that it reduces the need to use the afterburner. Among other things, this also means a reduced infrared signature. It is actually possible to do something to reduce the exhaust plume infrared signature. The most effective solution is reducing the exhaust temperature, and there are a few ways to do that. The most radical is to reduce the exhaust gas temperature by using a turbofan engine rather than a turbojet. It is not widely known, but modern military jet engines are low bypass ratio turbofans. A turbofan is an engine where only part of the air goes through the inner hot core. A fraction of the air goes through a fan that acts as a very low uh, compressor stage and it accelerates the flow around the engine without warming it up. The two flows mix downstream the turbine and the cold flow mixing with the hot flow has uh, the effect of lowering the temperature at the nozzle. Reducing the temperature in the turbine is not advisable because it would greatly reduce the engine performance, while a turbofan may increase the engine performance. The bypass ratio is the ratio between the air that goes through the fan and the air that goes through the core. Military combat planes usually have a low bypass ratio to privilege thrust and high-speed performance, while civilian or transport planes engines have a high bypass ratio, placing fuel efficiency first. This methodology to reduce the plume temperature has the constraint of the engine design and the cooling of the plume is almost a side effect. The nail in the coffin is that the use of the afterburner actually nullifies the cooling. For this reason, stealth aircraft use design solutions to accelerate the mixing of the plume with the surrounding air. For example, the F-117 and the B-2 have thin, slit-like exhausts that produce an exhaust layer rather than a plume, which tend to be disrupted and broken up close to the nozzle. The F-22 exhaust, uh, up to a point, works in a similar manner. The F-35 other than the air blown around the nozzle has a jacked outer rim and some vents in the nozzle walls that, other than being useful for radar stealth, help mixing the plume with the atmospheric gas. Another way to reduce the conspicuousness of the plume is to geometrically hide it behind the tail planes, at least from some points of view. The paradigm of this approach is the A-10. The nozzle and the initial section of the exhaust plume are very well hidden behind the vintage tail of the aircraft. The view from below and from the side is obstructed quite effectively, leaving a limited arc of visibility from behind and from above. Since the A-10 main enemy is expected to be the shoulder launch surface-to-air missile, so it makes sense to block the view from below. Other aircraft have a similar approach, even if it is less radical. In particular, F-22, F-35 and F-18 have the nozzle in a position well advanced in respect to the trailing edge of the tail surfaces. This unusual geometry helps concealing the hottest part of the plane from the side bait not as effectively as it is done on the A-10. European modern designs actually seem not to be overly concerned with this point, while Russian designs are somewhat in bit. The case of the B-2 is particularly interesting because the nozzles and the initial section of the plume are on the wing upper surface, effectively screening from the lower hemisphere of the plane, and for a plane that is expected to fly at high altitude relying on stealth, well, it makes sense. So guys, if you like this video, I'm sure you will love the videos that are going to appear beside me. In the meanwhile, please like, dislike, subscribe and hit the bell so you won't miss anything. And if by any chance you could consider supporting the channel on Subscribestar or Patreon, that would be amazing and you will have my eternal gratitude. In the meanwhile, thank you very, very, very much for watching and see you in the next video.